brought to you by the Horror Writers of America. Um, today, we're going to discuss broadly bringing more horror into your public library, ranging from programming through metadata and book displays. We have a great panel of presenters here today, so we're just going to get started. First off is Greg Windsor. Greg, are you ready? I believe I am. Let's go ahead and... Okay, why don't you introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. My name is Greg Windsor. I work as a reference librarian for the Johnson County Library in Overland Park, Kansas, right outside of Kansas City. I also serve on the chair of libraryreads.org, which is a nonprofit association of librarians who nominate their top 10 books uh, that comes out each month, uh, horror titles among them. And uh, well, we're going to talk real quick about a brief overview of the genre and how it relates to librarians. So let's go ahead and share the screen. Okay, first of all, hi, my name is Greg. Um, but one of the important things I always like to talk about when it comes to horror in, li in libraries is that horror always lurks around us. Librarians, as in broad terms, um, seem to kind of sometimes not get horror as much as uh, like a romance or a mystery genre or a thriller genre. Um, but patrons love horror novels. And uh, one of the, the reasons that, that, that reflects this is that horror is, is pop culture around us all the time. If you look at uh, television shows like the new Lovecraft Country that's uh, recently showing on HBO, which has gotten monster ratings and, and even bigger monster um, social media talk. Um, uh, movies like A Quiet Place with Emily Blunt and John Krasinski uh, come out every month uh, on uh, streaming shows and also in and, uh, and, and rapturing uh, our patrons. And also uh, comic books um, and uh, all these peop all of these resources, patrons absolutely devour. But when it comes to libraries and librarians, sometimes we can leave that genre lacking. And so what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about that genre and how important it is and how librarians can connect to um, all that that need, that desire out there for um, horror. Um, also, knowledge of the horror genre is going to serve you well for reader's advisory for your patrons for several different reasons, one of which it falls into several big categories. Um, in, uh, I know uh, uh, Kathleen in uh, Novelist is going to talk about this a little bit later, but the speculative fiction, right, these genres where all, we all ask the questions of what if. So these are for your patrons who love that escapism, that flight of fancy. Uh, you, you would uh, recommend science fiction, um, fantasy, and horror, right? Horror is all about what if your nightmares were real? What if those unspoken horrors underneath your bed um, really were real? But of course, they, um, horror also crosses over into another genre. I, always like, I like to call this visceral fiction, right? These are emotional genres. These are genres that are built to hook your readers. They're great for reluctant readers or maybe readers that don't have a lot of time uh, or have a lot of um, or are very busy and they say they don't have time to read. I always like to give them a thriller, a romance, or a horror book, right? These things really set them up and really set their hooks into your patrons and really are great for, for kind of sticking them and making them come back for more. So knowing horror and being conversant with horror is really going to help you with your readers' advisory conversations with your patrons. So please don't overlook it. Now, when it comes to the why of horror, why do patrons love um, horror novels? And I'm, I'm taken by this quote from Clive Barker, which he wrote in 1987 as an introduction to uh, a short story collection by Ramsey Campbell. Horror shows us that the control that we believe we have is purely illusory and that every moment we teeter on chaos and oblivion. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if 2020 has taught me anything is that every moment that we live in is purely illusory, that every moment we do teeter on chaos and oblivion. And horror probably has helped get me through this year more than pretty much any other literary genre out there, right? Horror lifts that, that, uh, that sheets, that sheen of respectability and order on the universe and, and, and forces us to realize that 
uh, underneath it all is just chaos and oblivion and uh, horror knows this, right? Horror prepares us for these moments. Um, and this is that need that patrons um, connect to and can identify with. Um, but if you're talking um, to your patrons about horror, uh, let's go over a couple of guidelines because if, if, our, if we are not um, all that conversant with horror, how are we supposed to have those conversations with those patrons uh, whenever we're meeting them either out in the stacks or in our collections or online? So here's some kind of quick tips to kind of go over um, as you're talking to your patrons um, about, uh, about the horror genre. First of all, to start that conversation, what movies and TVs and comic, comic books do you like? If we are surrounded by uh, horror and pop culture at large, have them talk about those areas of pop culture that they love, right? Do, what do they love about it? If they watch Stranger Things on Netflix, right? Ask them what about that show really touches them. Is it the small town eerie atmosphere? Is it the um, young telekinetic girl? Is it the, uh, the three friends on bikes um, solving um, the, the unraveling the world's problems? Is it this eerie underworld um, that is barely held back um, by technology? Um, what is it about that? And as you talk about to them, um, you will kind of suss out um, what the patron is looking for and, the, and what ultimately all that, con that reader's advisory conversation is training your ear to listen to keywords and, and um, genres and appeal factors that your patrons will reveal as they talk about what they want. So you as a librarian always have to be listening and to, and to ask those questions. Um, what we do in the shadows, which is a fabulously wonderful um, show on FX, kind of a send up of uh, the vampire genre. Is it more, do they want something that's a little bit more kind of more tongue in cheek, right? A little bit more funny and, uh, and humorous. Maybe um, they recently watched The Invisible Man, the, movie, the remake movie with Elizabeth Moss. Uh, that's, that's not only a horror movie, it's also a social critique of, uh, of women's roles in society and how believable women, women are uh, as a society, as, as uh, a man stalks them. Maybe something like Jordan Peele's Us with a social edge to it. Uh, maybe a graphic novel like a Saladin Ahmed's wonderful uh, limited series Abbott about a, a private investigator in 1970s Detroit um, tracking down um, uh, occult murders. So there's a lot of other options out there in the world. Ask them to talk about them and that will lead you to the horror novels, those appeal factors that you want. Another thing uh, I always like to talk about when it comes to a uh, readers advisor conversation is I'm, I like to ask what's your monster, right? What's your thrill? What's your scare? Because most people think of horror in terms of, um, of monsters, right? So if someone says, well, I really want a good vampire novel, that'll lead you to those subgenres, those appeal factors that will, that will connect those with patrons. Like for example, if they do like vampires, then you can recommend something like Justin Quinn's The Passage which is kind of this big, epic, sweeping, post-apocalyptic um, vampire novel uh, virus that is unleashed upon the world and a small band of survivors um, has to go through the wilderness to find a way out. Um, Let the Right One In, which was made into a fabulous movie, um, Lindquist, about a, a, young, uh, a young boy who bef befriends a mysterious young girl who helps him uh, with, her pro with his problems. And of course, that is a vampire and um, badness ensues. Maybe they like haunted houses, right? Maybe they want something that goes bump in the night. Well, then you can direct them to, to something like White is for Witching by Helen Oyoyemi, which is a, a fabulously wonderful Gothic um, horror novel where the house itself is a main character uh, in the book. Uh, maybe something like Scott Thomas's Kill Creek, uh, shout out to Scott Thomas, uh, um, who's based in uh, Kansas. Uh, this is a, a haunted house novel where four, uh, or a group of horror novelists come to spend a night in a haunted house. And, um, and uh, it sounds like the setup of a joke, but hilarity does not ensue. Bad things happen. It's a wonderfully gripping read. Maybe they're more into like the zombie apocalypse thing. Maybe then you can direct them to something called like a, a Colson Whitehead Zone One or a Paul Tremblay's Survivor Song that just came out this year and absolutely needs to be on your uh, to be read list if it's not already. Um, another thing about horror is what is your scare level? Like, so when I talked about those uh, visceral genres like thriller and, and romance earlier, 
all of those genres have kind of intensity levels built into them, right? So if you have romance, you have kind of the gentle, sweet, um, kind of, um, you know, uh, lifetime movie style kind of romances. And then you get all the way up to the spicier, you know, uh, erotica style uh, of romances, right? Same thing with thrillers, right? You might have a psychological thriller where the things under threat are more internal or more about relationships and hidden secrets. And then you get up to the thrillers with dudes with guns and terrorists and all those types of things. Well, horror does the same thing. There's a question of intensity. So you have gothic horror. So if you are maybe squeamish and you're not into um, the uh, being scared, maybe a, a gothic uh, or might be more your thing. And then you get up into the super intense Edward Lee and Richard Lehman where it's more extreme horror and splatter punk. So keep that question of intensity uh, in your mind as you go along. So let's quickly talk about some masters of horror, some um, uh, authors and titles that you should be familiar with and kind of helps you with that uh, introductory conversation with your patrons. This by no means is an exhaustive list, but I'd only, I only have so much time. So let's hit some quick highlights here about uh, some authors that you should know about and uh, that you might want to try yourself as you start learning more about uh, this genre of horror. I love, love, love talking about Grady Hendrix. Uh, my Best Friend's Exorcism is one of my personal all-time favorite books. I love it to pieces. I push it to everybody I talk to about horror. Um, Grady Hendrix is a kind of a big-hearted, almost optimistic horror writer, if that makes um, a sense. He loves, he's great with likable characters, uh, full of pop culture references. Um, my Best Friend's Exorcism takes place in a South Carolina suburb in the 1980s where two um, teenage friends um, one of them um, gets possessed and the other one has to fight uh, for her friendship and her life in one of the most terrifying uh, moments uh, of their life. He's also written uh, several other books, all great, uh, great to recommend. Uh, the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vam Vampires came out earlier this year and takes place also in that South Carolina suburb but it focuses on um, a group of book club ladies who uh, has to have to fight a vampire who insinuates himself into their neighborhood. Fabulous read. Um, also, if you've never read him, Victor Laval. He's been called a rising star in the genre for so long. I think he's just a star and just, uh, just have done with it. If you like your, uh, your horror a little bit more literary, uh, he's gonna be your guy. And I love to recommend The Ballad of Black Tom, which is a Lovecraftian, uh, ask um, takeoff. It is um, uh, is set in the Prohibition, New York City in 1920s, where a uh, hustling kind of musician uh, has to kind of do these odd jobs to get by, and he gets hooked up with a um, with a collector uh, with eldritch tastes. Um, he always has a social edge to it, and um, just is a wonderful uh, read alike um, for like uh, the, the, the us, uh, the Jordan Peele uh, type books out there. Also, he has a great uh, uh, Victor Laval's Destroyer, which is a great comic book, um, uh, kind of a graphic novel, which is a riff off Frankenstein, which I highly recommend as well. Anything that he does, uh, short stories through novels, is going to be um, worth your time. Shirley Jackson, um, she is, I'm not going to talk about her too much. She is extremely um, well known. Um, I, uh, as a young kiddo, as a young impressionable child, as a sixth grader, I read the, the lottery, not knowing what it was about, and it pretty much peeled my brain back, and it was impressionable, uh, left an impressionable love of the genre uh, for me. But if you've read that and, and want to read more, The Haunting of Hill House and We Always Lived in the Castle are wonderfully character-driven, atmospheric classics of the genre um, that are, were, which were uh, appropriate back in the 60s and appropriate um, today. Um, Joe Hill um, is the son of Stephen King, an author who I have not mentioned thus far because if you know anything about the genre, it's probably that dude uh, now, known as Stephen King, but his son has all the talent that Uncle Stevie does and is a great read. Um, Nosferatu um, is a great, um, uh, recently made into a, uh, a show on FX. Um, Lock and Key, which is a graphic novel series, um, also got made into a, no a show on Netflix, which is absolutely delightful about a, uh, a house with all of these magic keys that when used, open the doors to these other uh, dimensions and also gives uh, the uh, abilities to the, uh, the main characters. And actually, uh, he is actually partnering with DC Comics in a, for a run of comic books called Hill House. 
also kind of uh, taking that uh, taking that DC um, comics love and then inject that those horror elements in it and projecting it all into a new audience. He's doing lots of fun and exciting things. So keep your eye on Joe Hill. He's conquering the world as we go along. Um, Stephen Graham Jones is another solid author. I love to recommend his uh, novel, The Only Good Indians, uh, came out this year and is one of the top books that you absolutely have to read. Um, he is a member of the Blackfoot, uh, Blackfeet Nation tribe, and this particular book, uh, The Only Good Indians, for uh, childhood friends go hunting illegally on the reservation and take part in kind of a, a, a kind of a, a bad incident, an atrocity uh, involving local elk. Uh, tr uh, tr uh, and ten years later, a mysterious entity them and they have to deal with the retribution of what they did. It's a delightful book. Um, Mongrels is another good one, um, uh, kind of werewolf style uh, that I always like to recommend. And then um, finally, uh, Sylvia Moreno Garcia. Uh, she's been around for a while, but she's really hit it big this year with Mexican Gothic, um, a, um, which my, my library is doing a, a, an online book club um, version for. It is a kind of a, a 1950s uh, kind of a Mexican kind of a debutante uh, from, a, from a high society family gets sent to a um, kind of a decrepit rundown uh, manor house that is holding lots of secrets um, around every corner. Uh, but she also dabbles in other um, genres as well, thrillers uh, and, uh, and mysteries. She's absolutely well worth checking out um, and uh, as a good addition to your Reader's Advisory Toolkit. But uh, I'm going to leave you with a picture, one of my favorite pictures, Stephen King, Clive Barker holding a cat. And uh, after this picture was taken, the cat was never seen again. No, I'm teasing. But anyway, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, and really, and uh, thank you for the Horror Writers Association for having me, and uh, hope to see you in the stacks. Thank you, guys. Next up is Kathleen, who's going to talk to us about themes in horror. Are you all ready, Kathleen? I am ready. Oh, I'm going to share my um, presentation. Thank you so much, Lila. Let's see. All right, hopefully everybody can see the slideshow. Um, let me know if you don't. Um, let me start by introducing myself. My name is Kathleen Kaiser. I am the Metadata Strategy Manager at Novelist, which means I work with a team focused on developing ways and vocabularies to better describe books and to connect readers. So I'm gonna continue on the topic of RA, but I'm gonna focus on metadata and specifically horror themes and how this can be another tool to help horror readers. Now, in order to get a better sense of themes and how to think and use them, I think it's helpful to take a step back and talk a little bit about the idea of metadata first. So if you boil it down, the goal of metadata is actually pretty simple. It's all about access, it's discoverability. It's all about getting the readers to find the book. And I want to identify the most significant uh, access points for the material to meet the user's needs. So I need to describe the book in such a way that it makes it discoverable, not to any reader, but to the right readers. So let's say I'm looking at The Haunting of Hill House, and I describe it with headings like Romanesque post-industrial manor house or wealthy psychic researchers. You know, I'll probably have a better chance of getting this book into the hands of Mr. Peanut or Rich Uncle Moneybags, you know, which is okay. I mean, I don't know their life, but I'm probably also shutting the door to a lot of other readers. Now, for those of us who have read the book or seen any adaptations, you know, the house is definitely important. It's almost a character itself, but the type of architecture, the how the house looks, what's inside, you know, it really isn't that most significant. And using um, kind of a very academic type of vocabulary is rather limiting. It puts up a barrier to entry. When you see words that you don't know, you know, it's hard to think that this book is for you. Um, so what you highlight, what you call important is really important. Um, how do you help a horror reader find their next read? You know, how can I describe and talk about it so that a horror reader understands and speaks it? So let's take a look at a record. Here's a screenshot of a marked record for Get Out. Um, so for description, we have four, technically three genres, horror, mystery, comedy, and DVDs. 
Um, and I would say they all fit, they are totally appropriate. And um, we also have some other headings. Uh, we have interracial dating, um, missing persons, African Americans, crimes against. So are those significant? I mean, totally. You know, we also have some actors listed here. So we have some really good access points. But for someone who's not familiar with this movie and is looking for just a movie, you know, are these headings going to be what brings them to this film? You know, does it give them enough information about it? I mean, are they even going to search for any of these? So for those of us who are familiar with Get Out, you know, it kind of feels like we're missing something. And so this is where themes come in. So what exactly are themes? They are these recurring plot lines, topics, settings, characters. They're so popular and well known that it gives you a good idea of what the story is about. It kind of gives you a sneak peek of what to expect. Uh, and they're so well known because they're over and over and over again. These themes, or sometimes called tropes, um, usually come from an area like a genre or a fandom, and they become part of pop culture where it has a larger audience. More people know what it means. Like, for example, you might not read romance, but you probably know what Opposites Attract is about. You might not watch Star Trek, but you might know what a red shirt means. Or you don't watch Star Wars, and you might know about the Force. So it's like you already have a common language that you know and you can speak to readers. Let's take a look at an example. Here we have Jaws, which is one of my personal favorites. Um, and so here we have some of the headings that we have in Novelist. Now they do describe what is happening, you know, kind of type of characters, the appeal or the feel of the book. But does it feel like it's missing something? Does, it, does this really give you enough to book talk the book? But let's add some themes. And this really gives us a good handle of what it's about. Rather than focusing on the specifics, we get a better idea of the book and a good idea of what to expect. You'll also notice that, it's, that Evil Animals is very colloquial. So you know, so the more you move towards a colloquial or pop culture based terminology, the more welcoming you are to readers. So you're lowering that bar. And also knowing these themes and focusing on them, I have a better route to a book recommendation. So for Jaws, if I focus on the theme, I can connect this book to ones like Cujo rather than just more shark books. Another way of looking at this and themes is kind of like the TLDR of a book. So it's like a quick and dirty summary of what you can expect. So let's get Keanu Reeves uh, to help me show you what I mean. So let's flashback to 1994. Did you see Speed? No? Okay, well, Keanu, he was on this race against time. Matrix? Okay, here he is. He's the chosen one, as if you were surprised. Um, moving on to the replacements. Yeah, he was an underdog athlete. And then finally is Vengeance. Um, hell hath no fury like Keanu Reeves scorn. Uh, now, obviously, there's more to these movies than that, but that really gets us on that right track. We have a good whole book set about the terms we know. So it's common terms that make it easier for someone to find, know what it fits, what they're looking for. So, all right, so let's do a little show and tell on some popular and notable themes in horror that we've identified in novelist. I have broken this up into three categories. So we have characters and monsters, plot and setting, and style elements. So let's go ahead and get started with some characters. Now let's look at four protagonist types, starting with um, band of survivors. Now here, teamwork is key. People work together out of desperation or by choice um, to survive. So this is like commonly associated with zombies, but it can be for other reasons too. In natural way of things, a group of women find themselves in desert jail with no memory of how, why they're there. You know, another way you can think about this theme is like the ultimate group project. Um, in girl, uh, childhood trauma, the terror really comes from pitting young people against monsters uh, or dark elemental forces. In The Haunting of Sunshine Girl, a young girl um, figures out she can ghost talk and now she has to battle some demons. Um, Final Girls are probably best known as the quintessential and arguably the most interesting characters in slasher films from the 80s, but these characters are very much still alive and well in print. 
Uh, I mean, lots of books even use the character um, as the title of the book. Now, these characters are equipped to do battle and even defeat the monster that nobody else could. So, you know, they're like nobody's manic pixie dream girl. And we sold our souls. A uh, heavy metal guitarist goes on a cross country quest to fight Satan and win back the souls her band um, sold. Um, so whether through virginity or ingenuity, um, the final girls fight to live again. And last, we have unreliable narrators. Here the terror comes from not knowing who you can trust in these complex stories. And while you might argue it's a spoiler, um, you really don't know what is true and what's not and when it's going to happen. It's that sense of uncertainty, um, which is terrifying. I mean, like in the look at all the uncertainty with like COVID-19, it's really terrifying to not know if and when this will ever end or if we're ever going to go back to pants at zip. And now, of course, you can't talk about characters in horror without talking about monsters. So here's what we can kind of consider the big four. So think like all the um, go-to Halloween costumes you see at Target and Party City. So vampires, witches, werewolves, and zombies. But you know, so where does that leave us? So we have identified like five other types of monsters. Creature feature is for non-supernatural monsters other than that big four. So they're fantastical or mythological characters, you know, sea monsters, goblins, um, chupacabras or sneaky sasquatch. Or in The Devil in Silver, it's a shadowy monster that may or may not be the devil who roams at night in this creepy asylum. Now we talked briefly about evil animals, but here it's just about regular animals becoming real monsters. Um, you know, they might transform for a variety of reasons, but the real terror is coming from the fact that a normal creature is now anything but. You know, and this can also include normally dangerous uh, creatures like sharks or alligators, but they do have this like otherworldly or evil quality that kind of ramps up the terror. You know, a lot of horror is about taking something regular and flipping your expectation, taking something that is safe and it feels good and subverting it. So for creepy clowns and bad seeds, you know, it's the idea of innocence and childhood that is distorted into something terrifying. And so this can be for settings like a carnival, or this can be for characters and items that appear innocent or have these like innocence qualities. So like clowns, uh, homicidal children, haunted dolls, scary Santa, uh, virtual kindergarten Google mates, and it all fits right here. Like in Fledgling, it's a little girl who's a vampire and obviously she's a hungry vampire. I mean, that's the only time they have. Um, evil transformations, I mean, it's Jekyll and Hyde kind of sums up the whole thing right there. And then we also have uh, real life monsters. And these are just like seriously disturbed people. I mean, these are bad people, like cannibals, torturers, ser serial killers. And so the thieves, the author is really trying to disturb the reader um, through the character's shocking behavior and acts. So these tend to be very disturbing, very graphic, very violent. So like Norman Bates or Patrick Bateman. Now, a lot of these books do kind of straddle that fence between horror and psychological suspense. Um, but for me, uh, when it's horror, the plot is more focused on the monster rather than like the people trying to solve it or solve the mystery. So next up, I'd like to talk about um, plot and setting. So for plot, these are all kind of pretty self-explanatory. Um, in Cursed, it can be objects or people. In Hex, it's actually a town. Um, possessed, um, you know, it's Satan or the devil um, uh, using uh, characters, but it could also be like houses, objects, cars. Trapped is kind of where you, there really is nowhere to go. Um, so like cruise ships, um, research bases in the Arctic, um, or an isolated cabin with no Wi-Fi uh, in the cabin at the end of the world, because I kind of expect there to be no Wi-Fi or broadband cable at the end of the world. And then, of course, vengeance. Um, here, the characters really, typically, they did it to themselves, and that's why it really hurts. You know, and this could be also for characters who they themselves have been wrong. Uh, in some way by a monster, and they're just mad as hell. Moving on to setting. While horror novels take place everywhere, we really, there's really three main themes that we were able to identify. 
So probably one of the first things people think of when thinking about horror is a haunted house. I mean, and rightfully so, tons of books, classic and contemporary, um, use that as a setting. So we actually broke that down into two different ones, either moving into a haunted house or actually don't go in there. So moving, you know, it's, it does have this element of being trapped because it's like you just signed a lease, you just unpacked your stuff. Um, but obviously it doesn't have to be a house. Um, it could be a xenophobic apartment building, as in the case of Infidel, uh, versus go in there. I mean, here the characters voluntarily go into a high place. Besides haunted places, there's also small town horror. So um, like pro tip, if you're in Maine, make a U-turn at Derry, nothing good ever happens there. Um, the small towns, um, they can be where the residents that live there face these monsters routinely in it. Um, or um, it could be for out-of-towners and tourists who, you know, are stumbling upon like sketchy inbred families or as in the ritual, hikers that discover some creepy pagans. So moving on to the last category are style elements. Now these aren't so much about plot as they are about characteristics, like the feel. So framing devices such as letters, journals, videos, you know, even now with tweets, text, um, to kind of highlight the horror in real time in like found footage. You know, it's all about using another medium to help bring authenticity and this like voyeuristic element to the terror. And we also have body horror. So I talked earlier about how horror is all about subverting what you think is safe. So in body horror, it's all about your body. Um, these books typically are, um, revolve around something, you know, disgusting, gruesome things that can happen to your body, whether it's a supernatural means or, you know, natural means, you know, like pregnancy. Um, these do tend to be very graphic, disturbing, um, because they're really talking about um, the perceived norms of the human body and totally um, playing with that. I also have Lovecraftian horror, and Greg mentioned it briefly, so I'm not going to talk about it um, too much. Um, uh, if you're not aware, um, Lovecraft is a classic author, tales of like, otherworldliness and monsters beyond human comprehension. Um, my colleague at Novelist, Caitlin Connor, wrote an excellent article all about Lovecraft, and she notes that as influential as Lovecraft is to a horror genre, he perpetrated some really awful, racist, sexist, xenophobic views. Um, they make the reading that is at best uncomfortable and at worst actively harmful. So thankfully, there is a trend of authors deconstructing and subverting uh, Lovecraft um, for to tell these types of stories from the pers perspectives of the very people Lovecraft often denigrated in his works. So now that we've talked about themes, you know, how can you find them? You know, how do you tell what theme a book is about? So, but not always, but often book jackets and titles can be really helpful. So if you look at these four, you know, the titles themselves gives us a hint. So we got Frankenstein, Devour, um, Graveyard, Baby Teeth. You know, you can't judge a book by its cover, but looking here, we can see some more clues. Like there's teeth in Devour. Um, so it's probably some sort of animal. Um, on baby teeth, there's a broken lollipop, so it's probably dealing with kids. And it is also worth noting that horse um, also often mix and match um, popular themes to create new and terrifying scares. Okay, so for example, if we take Band of Survivors and we add traps to that, we can get the terror by Dan Simmons. Or if you are moving to a haunted house and possessed, you can get the Amityville Horror. And of course, the possibilities are endless once you add other elements like genre and appeal and how an author is known to write. If you're thirsty for more, you can find all of them on the novelist homepage right up in our orange bar. And there you can browse by theme. And if you wanna see all of our themes, please see the Secret Language of Books booklet, which will be linked at to download, um, which is included in this presentation. And if you have any questions on this or anything in Novelist, please feel free to contact me at any time. And now I'll hand it back over to Lila. Lila? Okay. 
All right. Well, I'm going to give a short presentation now all about using um, book displays in your library, which is the easiest way to uh, bring horror to the front with people. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Okay. All right, my name is um, Leela Denning. I am Acquisitions and Technical Services Coordinator for the St. Petersburg Library System in Florida. Um, and part of what I do is I set up book displays for my library system. And part of what I try to do is mix in genres. Um, it's not setting up a book display. It's not like writing a paper for grad school. Um, the only people that are going to nitpick you about whether or not a book is horror or suspense or thriller are people on Twitter. So feel happy to just combine them. One of the ones I like to do is variations of not such a home sweet home where I mix in psychological suspense and domestic thrillers, haunted houses, dysfunctional families, and people may stop because of a cover or a book they're familiar with, and they could walk out with a horror novel, even if they would tell you that they don't read horror. Um, patrons read horror any time of the year. You may circulate more of it in October, but I guarantee you it circulates all year. People on vacation and at the beach, not everyone wants those light, poppy, frothy, humorous books. I live 15 minutes from the beach, and I guarantee you people take horror and thrillers to the beach and bring them back with sand in them. They check them out all year. Uh, people who like to read suspense, thrillers, and mysteries are really an ideal audience for horror. Uh, the first horror novel I read was Cujo at a very inappropriate age because my mother brought it on vacation with us to the beach. Um, these are three displays I set up. I reuse the same sign. These are actually three different years. Um, and one had graphic novels. The other one, they're e pretty easy for anybody on staff to fill in. They all understand what a horror or a scary book is and it moves a lot of horror in the middle of summer. Um, February, Women in Horror Month, you can provide an alternative. I read romance. Everybody like, you know, romance, love stories, but you can also help circulate horror and provide access to a bunch of women who write horror. Um, and again, be really broad with how you define it. Use what you have in your collection. If you have to mix suspense or dark mysteries or urban thrillers in there, don't worry about it quite as much. Um, this is one somebody else in the library set up with murder and I would throw horror in this. There's a lot of murder and death that takes place obviously in horror. Um, you can mix in romantic suspense and horror on the same display and by using sort of themes like the ones Kathleen talked about, you can kind of be loose and fast with genres and subgenres. Um, these are witches. They cross genres very easily. These have paranormal romance and some historical fiction and obviously a lot of horror in them as well and some nonfiction even. Nonfiction audiences are also primed to read horror. Go upstairs and grab books on cryptozoology and serial killers and the history of horror movies. Um, this one even has a Stephen King book on writing mixed in as well as um, some movies. Younger patrons like to read horror. Um, you can market it as horror pretty easily to young adults. Um, Goosebumps is still popular. These are also some scary, some kids sort of scary movies. I have a book list um, that I can provide to share that talks about, I think it's spooky books. Spooky, scary, creepy books, gross books. Any kid will be allowed to read those, even if you put a sign up and said, you know, elementary school horror, they might not be able to check it out. But creepy and scary books are certainly something that might seem more accessible to parents. Short stories are a great introduction to horror. You can throw up short story collections any time of the year, not just in October. 
Short stories are really popular, especially horror collections right now. When pop culture is full of horror and horror adjacent themes, take advantage of it. Um, folk horror, broadly defined when Midsommar came out. Um, Lovecraft is obviously popular now and It and Bird Box and even something like Manhunter that's about serial killers. You could certainly find a way to work horror into that display when something's really in the, you know, in the air and pop culture, people will come into your library looking for it. You could obviously translate any of these into online book lists um, if your library isn't open. We do a lot of cross genre displays. World Goth Day is apparently a thing. Uh, Be Possessed by a Book, which included, you know, satanic and horror about demon possessions as well as nonfiction. And um, shifting, you know, there's obviously romantic suspense and horror about shape shifting and werewolves. Um, creepy crawlies, um, this is also a theme that's good for kids as well. And zombies include everything from urban fantasy and science fiction through to horror. It's pretty much more of a broad theme than people might think. Um, horror standards, people like Stephen King. One of these was actually old time authors from the 70s and 80s, um, as well as Stephen King. And you can throw up authors, people close to Stephen King or people you'd books you'd recommend if you liked Stephen King. So when people may stop and see a book that they know like Night Shift and they may see something else, putting books face out is really magical. It will grab attention and you can get all kinds of books to circulate. Um, I've literally done a book display that was nothing but a random collection of books and a copy of that picture of the cat hanging from the wire and people checked out the books because they saw the face out. So just don't get hung up on genre. Um, Gail Carriger, the author, talks about being a genre blender. And the idea behind these is to help people find their next great book, not to put together a perfectly curated collection of whatever genre or subgenre of horror. Um, make sure when you put them out, check for equity, diversity, and inclusion. Make sure the authors and the characters and the themes that you're putting up are, are diverse and include all sorts of people. And when you get those marketing emails from publishers and from the different kinds of library magazines and vendors, feel free to steal their ideas, their headlines, or the, you know, the book collections they're trying to market you, and just make it um, fit your collection. Okay, and um, I am on Twitter. I do post pictures when I do book displays out there. So feel free to use any of them. Okay, and that is it. And next we're gonna move on to Jillian, who is going to talk about using STEM in library programming. Okay, and next up we have Conrad, who's going to talk to us about libraries and library programming and horror. Are you ready, Conrad? Yeah, I'm ready. Hey everybody, my name is Conrad Stump. I am a local history associate for the Springfield Green County Library in Springfield, Missouri. So I kind of coordinate programming for the department and I represent the department district wide on some of our larger programming initiatives, such as Big Read, One Read, uh, Adult Summer Reading, and our annual Oh the Horror series. Um, and so today I'm mostly gonna talk about programming and sort of the steps of, you know, how you can ease into it. So let me go ahead and see if I can share my screen here. Okay, can everybody see that? All right, great. As you can see, this is me uh, impersonating a character in Bird Box as any one of us would do. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'll talk just very briefly about displays, but right, displays are sort of, if you're hesitant about doing horror programming or leading a horror book discussion, this is a great way for you to sort of ease yourself into that. Uh, it's also a great way for you to uh, promote the different programming series that you have going on. So for oh, the horror, we always put a display up. We try to get our other branches to put displays up. And then the only thing that I'll also add is 
uh, please merchandise your collections. Uh, everyone is different and, you know, I'm someone who is less likely to kind of go through and look at the spines and pick something out. I'm much more attracted to uh, seeing the covers and I think that a lot of patrons gravitate towards that. So it's important to sort of merchandise your collections and it also just makes it look a lot better. So displays are also a great place where you can do sort of uh, passive programs for patrons, right? So on the left is a picture where the patrons can suggest different titles. And then on the right, we had a librarian who did a um, Game of Thrones display and create an interactive element for that. So it's a great way for uh, patrons to sort of interact with librarians without actually necessarily having to speak with them because some of them might be more hesitant to do so. Uh, and then, of course, right, the next step after book displays are um, book clubs, right? And so, you know, if you have uh, a graphic design team or someone who can do graphic design, flyers are a great way to get the word out about that. Uh, book lists are also a great way to do readers' advisories. So, right, when Bird Box came out, we did a Bird Box Readalikes. Uh, we had Jennifer McMahon for The Horror, so we did a Haunted House book list. Uh, and we were having some authors like Victor Laval um, come for Oh the Horde this year, so we're doing Lovecraft reimagined book lists. So I've been running the uh, Donuts and Death book club for just over five years now. So this is Springfield Green's Horror Book Discussion Group. Uh, it has been very popular, so I, you know, knew pretty quickly that I was not the only person in the area interested in the horror genre. Um, so, and I try to do something fun for the group, right? So each time I'll hand out a short story and I will raffle off, raffle off a uh, paperback book. So just sort of a fun icebreaker uh, to ease into the discussion. So, you know, even if you don't lead a horror book discussion group, you could try incorporating a horror title into your book discussion group. And a lot of times, as has been said, librarians are a little hesitant about horror. Um, but sometimes the readers are not as hesitant as the librarians themselves. So uh, book clubs are also a great way to gain attention for your library. Um, Donuts and Death has been featured in a couple of regional magazines and it was featured in Book Club Reboot, 71 Creative Twists for uh, ALA. So, you know, a lot of times planning these programs, they kind of pay dividends because, you know, they bring more uh, notoriety to your library. So a few years ago, our library started uh, hosting a sort of Comic-Con event called Library Con, which brings in thousands of patrons. Uh, and so I knew that there was a, a desire for this type of programming and that we were kind of hitting the uh, fantasy and the sci-fi groups in our area, but we weren't necessarily doing a whole lot for our horror groups. Uh, so I decided to uh, create a horror series with our adult programming coordinator, Katie Hopkins, called Oh the Horror. Uh, so at our library con in 2017, I handed out uh, brochures that we created for the series and paperback books because we were having Grady Hendrix, who is, yes, the best human being on earth. Uh, and so it was sort of a fun way to interact with patrons and they could go home with something which would, you know, potentially bring them back to those programs. So this is just the uh, brochure that our community relations department created for our first year of Oh the Horror. Um, one thing I will say is be cognizant of the number of programs that you're planning. This first year, as you can see, we had a lot of programmings. So you may want to um, pare that down mostly to not create so much work for yourself, but also um, so that your community relations department or whoever promotes your programs is better able to sort of focus on your key programs. But one thing I wanted to do with the series is I wanted it to be very well-rounded, right? So we had a good number of programs, but then I also worked with book discussion group leaders in our district to get more book discussions doing, Grady Hendrix's books, and I partnered with local artists to have horror displays at our different branches. Um, so these are just a few things that we had. There's Farrell, the Journal of Ozark and Gothic in the center. Uh, they created a display at our Northside branch. Uh, I created a paperbacks from hell display at our Northside branch. And then we had local artists, Chad Woody and Scott Sauer um, at a couple of our other branches. So 
it not only sort of helps you have a more well-rounded series, but it gives you another place to promote that series and to sort of, you know, give your patrons a place to, to interact with what you're trying to do without necessarily um, having to speak to them about the in-person programs. One of the easiest things that you can do, I think, for a program series is trivia. Uh, it's very popular. It's fairly easy to put on. Uh, and so we've partnered with a local pub called um, Missouri Spirits each year for Oh the Whore to put on a, a trivia night. So that's one of the easiest things you can do. Uh, another really easy thing you can do for a program series is partner with a local theater uh, to, to put on a movie showing. And what I always say is I think about something that, you know, has some nostalgia where you know, you might be of an age where you remember seeing it in the theaters, or you're of an age where you were too young to see it in the theaters, and you would like to really see it on the big screen. So that's what we normally try to go for. Uh, the first year we did The Exorcism, which was great. Uh, the second year we did Silence of the Lambs, and then the third year we did Poltergeist. So all kind of very popular movies that fall into that 70s and 80s time frame. Uh, I think Silence of the Lambs is 90s, but you get my point. Uh, but just sort of that have some nostalgia to them. So these are just some of the uh, slides that our community relations department created for the program series. As you'll see, there's a lot of uh, local history programming, Ozarkian Campfire Tales, Is Midtown Carnegie Haunted, Ozark Urban Legends and Superstitions, uh, even St. Louis Possessed, which is not our area, but is close enough that people would be interested in it. And that, of course, is the uh, the actual case that inspired The Exorcist. So local history is very popular. It's a really great way to put on horror programming that is not necessarily, um, you know, horror movies or horror novels, but just sort of those things that people are attracted to, hauntings, true crime, uh, mythical beasts in their area. So there's a lot to work with there. Um, and there are a lot of people that you can partner with whether they are area academics um, or, you know, local historians. So it, you're not necessarily having to bring in authors, um, but you can sort of put on a, an interesting presentation with a keynote speaker, and that may also fit better into your budget. And the local history programs, like I said, have been some of our most popular programs. We did a haunted Route 66 travelogue. Uh, the speaker who came to talk about the actual exorcist in St. Louis, I think that attracted about 120 patrons. So that was one of our most popular programs. Um, and then sort of, you know, I mentioned area academics. One thing I want to mention is that, you know, you can do academia and pop culture and it can be successful. You just have to think about those things that people are attracted to that are a little, um, more highbrow while making them fun. So we had Emily St. John Mandel as our big read author a few years ago, and we did a program about cults. And that was one of our most popular uh, one read programs that year. And then for the next year, we had uh, Madeline Miller who wrote Circe and write mythology. Some people are really interested in it. I'm one of those people, uh, but some people think, oh, mythology snore, <laughs> but you know, it gives you a lot of stuff to play with as far as, um, you know, the ways patrons can interact with it. And it has that sort of Comic-Con uh, element where people can dress up. So it can be fun. And we did a program called Pushing Back from Cersei to Me Too. So, right, Cersei is kind of a feminist retelling of that tale. Um, and we were able to partner with a local anthropologist to talk about uh, powerful female deities throughout time, which then kind of segued into uh, a local comic historian talking about female superheroes, and then that segued into a woman who works in the media talking about the Me Too movement. So you can take these things that feel academic, but also sort of twist them to make them timely. Grady Hendrix was fantastic our first year. Uh, and this slide to me illustrates something about library program, which I always say is count the number of gray heads. Because a lot of times with library program, we're trying to attract a younger crowd, but we often attract an older crowd. So horror programming to me 
is something that younger people are very interested in. Uh, and so I'm always pleased to see that it attracts a, a nice variety of ages. This is just sort of the display that we created in our concourse for Grady Hendrix's visit, uh, his signing line. So we had a very successful first year of Oh the Horse. So of course we did it again. As you can see for our second year, we pared down the numbers of programs. Uh, we also hosted them at our main branch as opposed to spreading them across the district because we were trying to get uh, funding. So we knew that we'd get the most people at our main branch. Uh, and so then we could say, you know, this is how many people came uh, and give us some money. <laughs> and then one other thing I wanted to note is that, you know, the programming that you do can inspire other librarians uh, to feel more comfortable putting on programs themselves. So the second year that we did Oh the Horror, uh, our main branch did a Stories After Dark program, and then our uh, most historic branch, the Midtown Carnegie branch, did a Night at the Haunted Library program. So we had an effect on other librarians in our district and in, in the programs that they planned. Uh, and just talking about that local history aspect, we had a woman who uh, writes a blog called Ozarks Alive, Caitlin McConnell, and she did a Monsters of the Ozarks program our second year. That attracted, I think, 130 something people. Here's kind of a, a more panoramic view to show you just sort of how packed the room actually was. And we also had Lyle Blackburn, who is a cryptozoologist, who came and talked about Bigfoot. That attracted over 100 people. So these programs can be very popular. Um, and like I said, both of these had a local history aspect. So that's something to explore because it's easier to do uh, than it might be to bring an author in. But you also don't have to just wait until October to do these. We did a Wild Things of the Ozarks display in our local history department. This is still currently up. Uh, it's been up, I think, since March or April. Uh, but it has been very popular. Uh, we had a, another kind of graphic in the concourse to bring people back to the display. And we have a book display um, set up so that people can sort of take books that relate to the physical display. We had Kia Wilson, Wilson our second year, who wrote uh, We Eat Our Own, uh, which is fantastic. And she was really great. But what I want to mention is that, you know, for this event, we had maybe 16 people. Uh, and in libraries, we talk about numbers a lot and we think numbers are all that matter, but it was a really great event. Everyone who was there really enjoyed it uh, and the author really enjoyed it. So, you know, don't necessarily look to just the numbers, think about the overall experience and uh, what everyone is getting out of it. The other part of that is, you know, don't be afraid to ask someone, uh, that works with you to take pictures of your program or to write something nice about your program. Because uh, if no one, you know, no one writes about it for your library's, you know, staff publication, if you have one or through email, uh, then your staff doesn't necessarily know that it went on and that you did this thing. So, I mean, it's, it's really important for um, self-promotion, but it's also really important for documenting your programs and program series. Uh, if you are going to be looking to repeat it the following year or ask for funding from your friends group or your foundation. The third year we had Jennifer McMahon, which was really fantastic. Uh, and the main point I want to make is each year we've had themes for the series. So the first year was kind of exorcisms. The second year was monsters. The third year was haunted houses. Uh, and so that to me gives you a, a great place to start working from when you're thinking about the types of programs that you want to plan. So Jennifer McGann was really great. We had a great turnout. Uh, we took her on local television to talk about her book and her uh, appearance at the library. We also partnered with a local historic theater um, for a Ghost of the Galois program. So working with community partners is another great reason why local history is important to horror programming. Uh, because there are people in your community that will want to work with you, and that just adds another avenue for promotion for your event. This year, we have gone virtual. Uh, so, and, you know, with COVID-19, with everything that is going on with the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, we wanted to put something on that spoke to both of those. So, uh, we focused on Lovecraft, 
and sort of how uh, authors of color and female authors are reinterpreting his tales or his mythos uh, to sort of reckon with his racism. So these are just, on the left is the um, page for our program's publication, and on the right is the image that went in the display in our con course promoting those events. So even if you're doing virtual right now, you can do author events, we're doing virtual trivia, we're doing an escape room that's done through Google Forms, and we're doing programs in a bag, which is really great, that has crafts, word puzzles, it has kind of a little tchotchke, um, and book lists. So there are ways that you can do sort of virtual and fun things that are not necessarily in-person programs right now. We also planned a series for uh, summer scares, which I will talk more about in a, another panel. But horror is not just limited to October. Uh, we've had success in the summer as well with these programs. And as I mentioned, the Donuts and Death Book Club has been very popular throughout the year. Uh, if you would like to get in contact with me, you can follow me on Instagram at the Potai Librarian, or you can email me at at uh, Conrad S at thelibrary.org. Thank you guys. Okay. Okay, and next up we have Jillian who is going to talk about STEM programming at your library. You all ready, Jillian? I'm ready, absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'll share my presentation. Share it from the beginning. There we go. Uh, can everyone see the full screen? Great. Well, thank you for having me. I'm Jillian King Cargyle. I am the director of STEM Read at Northern Illinois University. And we do lots of different programs, both on campus and in schools and also in libraries to help people learn the STEM concepts while living the book. So um, what that means is we create lots of day-long games based on books that people can play through. Right now, we're also doing lots of virtual experiences. So I'll just give you a little more background on that, and then I'm going to show you uh, some of the programs that we've done. And we also, on stemread.com, have these activities written out so that you can use them in your library. So stemread.com is where you can find all of these free resources. And we are part of NIU STEAM programs, so uh, STEM outreach and also steaming it up, which does uh, professional development. Uh, but you can see that we, uh, we pull in lots of arts and history and culture as I was glad to see Conrad doing too. I love to uh, blend programming and really use great books as a jumping off point to explore lots of different things. So uh, my background is I definitely was one of the kids who was into spooky books. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it started with uh, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, then all of the Christopher Pike books, and um, then getting into Stephen King and, you know, Michael Crichton and things like that. So like horror and uh, sci-fi have definitely been my jam. Uh, but I didn't go into science. I went into... Uh, writing and filmmaking and I consider myself a professional science appreciator and I think it's my job to pull those exciting uh, STEM concepts and STEAM concepts out of popular fiction to get people more excited about reading and learning. Um, Daniel Krauss is a great author, uh, and we've got a quote from him that you can see most of, hopefully. Uh, horror is a great way of testing your limits, and testing your limits is a great way of broadening, broadening your mind, your heart, too. Uh, so I like that. I like that horror has this ability to really grab people's attention. So at STEM Read, we don't look for the books that everybody's doing or that everybody's already used or read in school, right? I, I 
I probably wouldn't pick the giver and get really excited about it, but that's just me. Uh, <laughs> I look for those, those books that are that non-required reading that are going to get the kids um, or the adults who didn't know they cared about a topic until they had this, this you know, more intense connection with it. And I uh, love what Greg called it, that visceral fiction. That's definitely what we look for. Um, and this is another quote uh, from Rebecca Thompson, who is a physicist. I firmly believe that everyone should have an understanding of at least a little science, be comfortable using common terminology and thinking of the ways a scientist would in order to understand the natural world and occasionally the unnatural ones too. Uh, so she wrote a great book called Fire, Ice and Physics, The Science of Game of Thrones. So looking at it from a scientific standpoint, what's really happening in pop culture and you know, could these things be real and all kinds of great stuff. Um, but I like this quote because it gets the point across that you know that uh, not everyone who comes to a STEM program or any kind of program in your library is necessarily going to leave uh, saying, I'm going to be a scientist now, <laughs> or I understand everything that I just heard. But if we can get them thinking um, about things in different ways, get them more STEM literate, then I think that we've, we're going far. Certainly in 2020, we've seen the need for people to be more science literate and be more accepting of new ideas. So this is another great way to push that through. All right. And one of the things that I love about horror and that I love about sci-fi as well is that you can see how it influences real science. So Mary Shelley was interested in the natural, natural philosophers of the day and um, then used their ideas to talk about electricity and the human body and, of course, the horrific consequences of playing God. Uh, but that also gave someone the idea to create the pacemakers. So you see that you have these um, science fiction, horror, pop culture has this cycle of creating new innovations. And so our programs are really about lighting that spark to get people excited. Um, and you see this too at the national lab level. So Argonne National Lab, which is near us in Illinois, used uh, the idea of zombie outbreaks uh, like Night of the Living Dead and The Walking Dead, and they use that in their uh, computer modeling uh, with data simulations with their supercomputers to see how quickly a zombie outbreak would uh, completely destroy the city of Chicago. And uh, it's about 60 days. So, <laughs> so Walking Dead got it pretty right, uh, but it's interesting to see how they can use that, uh, those horror ideas and those pop culture ideas to actually model what would happen with real outbreaks. And uh, so now they're working on COVID-19 and things like this, but their zombie outbreak study helped uh, inform them on a lot of things as they went into a real pandemic. All right, so my favorite thing that we do are the games that we create based on books. And um, I'm gonna talk about some YA topics um, and titles, but this is something that you could do for adult books or uh, for those younger readers as well. Really it's about finding a great book that has that visceral experience to it and then gamifying it. And what we do is we pull out the plot points from the book that could be good hands-on challenges and relate to a concept. So one of my favorite books to use is Quarantine by Lex Thomas. And in this book series, a biological weapon has accidentally been introduced into a high school. Oops. And <laughs> so within the first 30 pages or so, all of the teachers hemorrhage and die, and the students are locked in the building, and it becomes very queer, clear very quickly that no one is coming in to help them. So they get food drops every few weeks where uh, a helicopter just kind of dumps a big pallet of food into the quad, and other than that, they're pretty much left on their own. So things start out okay. Um, 
And, but very quickly, they break down, uh, and the students break down into tribes based on their social cliques. So I like to think of it as Lord of the Flies meets The Breakfast Club. It's a really fun book. Um, but what we did with it was we quarantined about 220 kids uh, from around the area in a, an empty school. And we broke them into teams. They were randomly assigned into teams based on these uh, social cliques, like, you know, the, the pretty ones were like the cheerleaders, you had the jocks, you had um, the, the geeks and the nerds and the sluts. And so you've got all these great um, character types that are in here playing this game. And I'm going to show a video uh, so you can see what some of that looked like. So we like to start the experience right away. We wear a lot of costumes. We got uh, fighter fighters to spray down the buses as they were coming in <laughs> to decontaminate them. You are a danger to your family. You have been quarantined for your own safety. Bullhorns always make things better. a series of challenges to prepare you for your new life in quarantine. You've been broken into teams to help you survive the challenges. The team names take stereotypes and turn them into empowerment. We will be using lessons learned at McKinley High School. So whenever possible, we have the authors come in and Ooh, give their perspective. So it felt like the book. Yeah. It felt and like we were seeing the book. Viruses have some kind of we work with uh, national labs and other experts to give you more information and make lots of connections. So if you watch that video, um, <laughs> you, you probably wouldn't think, wow, those kids are learning a lot about economics. Uh, but <laughs> that was what they were doing. So they learned about uh, epidemiology and the spread of viruses. They learned about economics and the ideas of scarcity in that uh, challenge where they were all running at things. What they had to do was they um, had a stack of newspaper and a stack of masking tape or of uh, duct tape per team. And they were supposed to use the engineering design cycle to design something to carry as much as possible into this food drop and, and come out with, with what they had. And so they did that. They made their design and everybody <laughs> ran at the pallets. And I had a kid come up to me and he said, I just bought someone wrestled with someone for an empty box of Cheerios, and I'm not even hungry. I understand scarcity now. And I was like, yes, we did it. <laughs> and so, um, but they never would have had that experience if they didn't have this great book to get them emotionally um, excited about these topics. So I'm going to go through another uh, activity, kind of break down one of the activities for you. We also did Frankenstein, the STEM read experience, and we used uh, Mary Shelley's book, of course, but uh, as I've seen in some other people's presentations, we also used uh, Kirsten White's uh, great newer book, The Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein. And that book tells the story from Elizabeth's point of view, and she's no longer a passive uh, character who becomes monster fodder. She is very much um, alive and uh, very uh, fierce and focused on her own survival. So it's, it's an interesting take on the tale and, and definitely gives Elizabeth a lot more agency. Uh, so in this one, uh, the kids were playing from the point of view of Elizabeth and um, they have to prove their loyalty. So in the book, Elizabeth was bought by the family to be Victor's special friend. 
and she had to uh, calm his temper and make sure, basically make sure he didn't murder a lot of people uh, so that she could remain within the family and not go back uh, to um, a poverty situation that they had found her in. Uh, so what we do for this one, of course, with Frankenstein, you're going to need to know some, some first aid. You're going to need to know about stitches, right? So we uh, highlight some of uh, the history of stitches. So early suturing, uh, ancient Egyptians used linen strips and Indians used uh, the jaws of black ants where they would have the ants bite the wounds and then they would cut off their heads to, to seal the wounds. Um, in the Renaissance, they used uh, animal tendons, tails, horse hair, intestines, and other amazing <laughs> things like that. So in Victor's time, they would have used bone needles, metal needles. They would have repurposed needles from other trades like sail making and glove making. They did not have antiseptic procedures until 1876, so well after the book takes place. And there was no mass-produced sterile needles until 1887. So here are some of the typical stitches that they would have used and some of the tools as well. Um, and then we would show a video about uh, suturing and how it's done now so people can get a feel for it. So this is um, simulated skin, uh, but it's a nice video. I won't show you the whole thing. So we talk about threading the needle and we show these nice images of how to make a complete stitch through the wound without ripping the wound. And how would that be hands-on? So we're not gonna have the uh, um, people at the program uh, cut themselves. That would be very messy in your library too. Uh, so what we do is we read a passage from the book where Elizabeth has to stitch up Victor's brother after he has cut him. And we use bananas. <laughs> so it's a banana that they have to make a complete stitch in and it's a relay race. Uh, so I'll show you a little bit from what this looks like. Hi, I'm Kirsten White. I am the author of The Dark Sun of Elizabeth Frankenstein, the Anti-Dark Trilogy. So we have props many more as well that we readers. do to I had the get people in the mood. to participate in STEM read at NIU. You are Elizabeth, and you are going to be Victor's special friend. Yes. And it will be the last tree I climb for you. You always hope that young readers will connect All with right, here's our bananas. Much of it. And then to get to come and experience hundreds of teens engaging in these games and talking with each other, and it was all based around my book and Frankenstein, but it was bringing in math and studying maps. We also brought in um, real world map challenges so and uh, a way that different puzzle challenges. Uh, throughout history, people are out ways to We had a historian race. talking about uh, resurrectionists and body stealing and how that played into uh, the history of I'm medical school. I'm a teacher at the university in the time arts department and I make artwork using electricity. We showed how art is being inspired by electricity to this day. We had two different uh, then, sound so artists come in and, and play with electricity. Cheering each other on and sprinting across the room to turn in And then the monsters. students had to uh, create a circuit <laughs> and wire their own fun. monsters. An amazing experience. <laughs> I saw how the worm inherited the wonders of the eye and the brain. But that's actually not romantic. What that is, is actually abusive. It just gives me so much hope in So we also look at uh, social emotional so to connect with young readers and turn them into people who are engaged and interested and excited about all the aspects of the world around them. It has been one of the greatest experiences. So the social time. emotional aspects of the book, because Victor and Elizabeth have a very unhealthy relationship. So we brought in someone from the uh, local uh, domestic abuse um, area and we uh, had her talk about toxic relationships and how to spot them. So as the students were playing through all these STEM games, they were also thinking about the choices Elizabeth made and whether she was um, good or evil, what did the sum of her choices make her and could she, um, could she redeem herself in the end? So 
another quick example is Scythe by Neil Schusterman that we've done programming for. Uh, so in Scythe, it's the uh, not too distant future. We have conquered death and the only way people can uh, die is at the hands of the scythes. And there are two teenagers who are becoming apprentice scythes and really understanding um, what it means to be mortal in this immortal society. Uh, so this book looks at things like AI and cybersecurity uh, and visual cryptography. Of course, there's a lot of human health and uh, medical ideas that you can bring in. Um, we also looked at, um, as you get farther into the book and into the trilogy, you see that there are different factions of sides. So you can look at uh, politics from a different lens, from a safe distance, and see how uh, these characters are, are being influenced by politics, even when it comes to the idea of who lives and who dies in this society. Um, you can also do things like poisons and uh, blood loss math and the physics of martial arts. Um, our latest selection is Bent Heavens by Daniel Krauss, and this is a, a great book uh, that explores the idea of alien and other. A teenage girl's father has gone missing. He thought that he was going to be abducted by aliens, and so he created lots of alien traps around his house. Uh, his daughter has been loyally checking them once a week, but she's pretty much done with it. She thinks that, um, you know, he just went crazy and, and took off. So she's uh, resenting the fact that she has to do this. And on the last day that she's going to check it, she finds something in the trap. And she and her friend have to decide whether to report it to the authorities or to take matters into their own hands. And they take matters into their own hands. So it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a really interesting, challenging book. Uh, but you can get into everything from corn mazes, the art, the psychology, the agriculture, and the technology behind them when you look at uh, how corn mazes are used and how corn mazes are used as an interesting device uh, in this book and some other uh, horror books like, um, it's right behind me, uh, there's, there's someone inside your house. Um, you can look at species variation and, and identification, you know, getting into um, Torture comes into play. Daniel Krauss has described this book as uh, E.T. with torture. Uh, so looking at the legal, ethical, psychological aspects of torture. And then uh, radiation and mutation, neurology, mental health, and of course, aliens. So, so many things that you can pull out of these books to do interesting programming. And this would be great for summer reading activities uh, with teens and the younger readers, but also with adults. I've had adults uh, come up to me, uh, different teachers and librarians that, that were training, and they say, can adults play these games too? Like, could we have like, um, could we do this at a local bar and <laughs> play through the games? And I say, yeah absolutely, please invite me. And um, so really, when you, when you gamify the book, you give someone a reason to read the book, and then you give them all of these ideas, that, these exciting ideas that can come out of it. And surely there's um, other books that they want to read then because of it. So it's just a great way to get people to learn more. And we are doing virtual programming based on these. So we um, put the games online and people can play through them either uh, like a reading club doing it in multiple weeks or as you know, kind of a synchronous uh, game that you could play together. Um, we also do a podcast uh, where we talk with an expert about a subject and then uh, talk with an author about uh, one of their latest books that explores a STEM concept. And we do monthly virtual talks about exploring the science and fiction concepts where um, authors and STEM experts get to talk together and ask each other questions. So they're really cool. And you can find the things that I talked about on stemread.com. And I am on Twitter. And you can email me with other questions as well. OK, thank you so much, Jillian. <laughs> All right, I think we're ready. Okay, well, thank you everyone for participating in the Horror and Libraries. I'd like to thank everyone who presented. And um, 
Thank you for providing such great ideas for helping everyone bring more horror to their libraries. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Bye. Thank you.